So let me get started. Uh, this is the cover uh, of, uh, of my book, which uh, was just published uh, at the end of June this year by the University of Washington Press. Uh, I am a professor, assistant professor in history department teaching at State University of New York, Buffalo, up in New York. Um, so uh, the, um, the title of uh, today's talk is pres Prescribing Poisons for Healing, a lesson from a traditional Chinese pharmacy. So uh, to start my talk, uh, I'd like to start with something uh, perhaps uh, all of you uh, are familiar with to a certain extent, uh, which is the, the contemporary view or sense of Chinese medicine, right? So when we think about Chinese medicine today, we often associate with practices uh, which is sort of exotic, unfamiliar, like acupuncture, right? Acupuncture is really the sort of the uh, uh, representative of the Chinese medicine, especially in the Western world. Right, so, and some of you may be yourself are acupuncturist, right? So, but I want to direct your attention to uh, uh, this word medicine. And medicine have this general sense of, you know, system of healing, but medicine also has a, a more specific uh, sense of medicinal substances, right? So that's uh, a plural, right? So, and that's something I find quite interesting, right? So this refers to the classical Chinese pharmacy a very important, if not the, the most important part of uh, traditional trust medicine, right? So, uh, and there's a variety of substances uh, used in, in the past and today in a uh, classical training pharmacy. Um, and my question, actually, this is a question that had been driving, driving me, uh, driving my research in the past decade. Uh, 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 and the fundamental question here is what is a matter so this seemed to be a very simple question right so but i think the answer if we really look into this question and think about the healing traditions in other cultures countries we find this is not actually so simple a question at all so let's go back to history uh to chinese history uh, in particular and to see uh what are some of the ancient you know doctors answers to this question uh, and so one doctor uh, I, um, I studied quite a lot, uh, his name is Sun Siniao, living in the seventh century. So more than a thousand years ago, he actually is one of the most famous doctors uh, in Chinese history. And in one of his formulary uh, collections, uh, he said, um, among the various things in the world, nothing cannot be a medicine. Right? So for him, there was no essential difference between medicines and non-medicines in the proper context. Anything could be a drug, right? That's his definition, very expansive definition of medicine. And in fact, if we look into the traditional Chinese pharmacy, uh, it was vast, right? So uh, containing not just uh, Herbal medicines uh, we are more familiar with. Uh, this is an example of ginseng and rhubarb, right? But also uh, minerals like uh, the lactite and mica um, and animal uh, products such as honey and beeswar. Right? Beeswar is the uh, gallstones uh, in, uh, in the cattle, right? So, and finally, food category like millet and scallion. Right, so these are just some of the examples in this vast uh, repertory of the collection of drugs in classical Chinese pharmacy. And so really, I think from my perspective, from this material perspective, right, study of trans medicine is really to explore this vast repertory of medicinal substances that have acquired diverse uses, values in Chinese history. And so uh, I want I want to uh, start with two contemporary views of the traditional Chinese medicine, particularly traditional Chinese pharmacy here, that I think is quite relevant to my own research. Uh, the first view is a more sympathetic view of traditional Chinese medicine. I think this audience, probably uh, many of you may have, or, you know, this, this kind of view of traditional Chinese medicine that is, you know, it is natural, it is mild, it is, has few or no side effects, uh, particularly in comparison to the modern biomedicine, 
uh, which is often considered artificial. Right? Synthetic drugs produced in a laboratory are more violent uh, and with side effects, toxic side effects. Right, so this is a, a sympathetic view of Chinese medicine, particularly in comparison to modern biomedicine. Uh, so, uh, is that true? Right, so this is my question mark one. Uh, the second view is more critical, uh, primarily but not limited to um, the biomedical researchers. Uh, they will say, well, uh, Chinese pharmacy has all kinds of pills, you know, drugs there, but uh, really, we don't really know what's in it. You know, oftentimes, the practitioners themselves don't know what's contained. Uh, oftentimes, they contain toxic drugs that is detrimental to human health. Um, this is uh, relative news of uh, a, a couple of years ago, the, the WHO actually uh, started to consider including traditional transmedicine into their catalog of drugs, right? healing you know, techniques. And this created some kind of responses in particularly in the scientific community. This is Nature, right? The flagship journal. Uh, and um, they, uh, they, they basically write, you no, know, this could be backfire because tra traditional remedies in China, you know, they could contain toxic substances that mean without knowing that uh, this comes with risks, right? This is a more critical view. So that's a question mark here as well, i say. So basically my book and my research in the past decade is really, I mean, I started from these contemporary views of traditional trans medicine, and then I went back to history to really try to find answers and, and, and prioritize both of these views. What I find actually is number one, classical Chinese pharmacy use lots of poison for healing, right? It's not, you know, they don't use poisons, right? So, and number two, doctors in the past in China, they were fully, they fully understood the danger and the benefit of poison. It's not like they didn't know what's going on and just to randomly make some drugs and see whether it worked or not, right? They fully understood the danger and the benefits of poisons. Right? So, um, and give you an example here, uh, aconite or uh, fuzi in Chinese, uh, this is a highly poisonous herb, and all herb, I mean, the flowers, the stem, the tubers, very toxic. But it was one of the most frequently used medicines in classical Chinese pharmacy. Uh, there are other examples of poisons uh, in Chinese pharmacy, including panali, banxia, uh, croton, that's bado. Uh, this in the herbal medicine category. Uh, minerals like cinnabar, uh, many of you probably know, this is the mercury compound. Uh, Cinnabar figured prominently both in Chinese medicine and uh, in alchemy. And matters like Python school bladder, right? So uh, often frequently used uh, in Chinese pharmacy. And these are just some examples here. And aconite actually is I mean, actually one of my favorite uh, poisons and uh, is a prominent character in my book. I, I'll come back to that later in this talk. Then the really the fundamental question here is that how could poisons become medicines, right? So uh, to uh, offer some answers uh, to this question based on my study of history of Chinese medicine, I want to start with a general uh, introduction of history of Chinese medicine in the pre-modern world, uh, pre-modern era. So basically I divide it into uh, three periods of time. And so starting from the ancient time, this is the Qin and the Han period time in China, roughly from the third century before the common era to third century after. Right? So this is the period time I would consider this is the foundational period time for Chinese medicine uh, with the rise of several important medical classics, uh, some of which you probably uh, know. Right? So like the Yellow Emperor's uh, Inner Classic, and Divine Farmer's Classic of Material Medica. So this is the formation of medical classics. And then from the 10th century on, from the Song period on, and Song Yuan Ming period. So this is a moment when government uh, and also social elites started to actively engage in uh, the reconstruction of some of the medical classics in ancient times, according to their own criteria and you know, needs. Uh, this is 
definitely facilitated by the uh, by the rise of printing uh, from the from 10th century first facilitated by the government later when printing spread out to all corners of society uh the medical text just blossomed i right? so at that it's a very important period as well so both period has been done you know been examined by scholars particular history of Chinese medicine in the past but what what is in between this long period of time of about you know 800 years uh, has been largely ignored. Uh, particularly, I want to emphasize that this period is very important for the development of pharmacology in China. In China, right? So, um, and this is actually the period I focus on in my book. And there are quite a, a few very important achievements in terms of the development of pharmacology during this period. I give you several examples here. For example, this text called Collective Commentary to the Divine Farmers Classic of Material uh, formed around 500. You can see this is a commentary to the Han text, Divine Farmers Classic. And it adds very important information to the understanding of, of the value or the use of poisons. Uh, I'll come back to this text later in my talk. Um, alchemy also flourished during this period of time. Here I'm, I'm referring to outer alchemy, the transforming of you know uh, mineral poisons into something they call elixirs to achieve longevity if not immortality right so that's a very prominent Taoist tradition flourishing during this period of time and also Sunsimia, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, uh, emerged in the early Tang period and he actually produced several very important formula collections uh, which involved abundant use of poisons uh, and he is one of the most famous doctors uh, in the Chinese history. And finally, uh, the last example I give here is this uh, this Bentao text called Newly Revised Material Medica, formed in the seventh century. It is actually the, the earliest state-sponsored pharmacological text in China, and some people argue in the world. Uh, so and that is important in terms of our understanding of state, like government's active role in promoting medical knowledge including knowledge about poisons uh, in the 7th century. So these are some prominent examples why this period is so important for us to understand pharmacology and so why I study it in particular with attention to poisons. Right? Um, so here, back to my book, right? Healing with Poisons, basically it's a book to really try to uh, uncover this almost lost tradition or very, very little known tradition of uh, using powerful, potent substances, i.e. poisons, for healing, right, for healing purpose during the period of time I just delineated to you. Uh, the content, uh, the book uh, has seven content chapters, uh, so I'm not going to go details to every chapter here. I'm just give you a kind of quick roadmap here, right? So. The seven chapters are divided into three parts. And the logic here is that for the first part, it follows roughly a chronological sequence that's from the era of division, that's after the Han period. Uh, there is a division of regimes between the North and South, so that period of time. And, and from that, that's part one. And then moving to part two, uh, basically Sui Tang period, that's from the, from the seventh century and to eighth century uh, and later. And that's basically is unified China with the central government in uh, in Chang'an, right? Currently Xi'an. So, uh, so that's a chronological movement. And then from the first two parts to the third part is more of a thematic movement. Uh, basically, it's from curing illness, right? That's one prominent role of poison, to enhancing life, right? So medicines in Chinese pharmacy did not just cure illness but it served this higher goal of enhancing life. So the last part focuses on this latter aspect, uh, particularly in alchemy and in the use of a very popular drug called five-stone powder. Um, so for today's talk, now this is basically an introduction, right? So uh, now I'll, I'm going to delve into uh, particularly the first unit of my, uh, of my book, which I think will be uh, will be most interesting to this audience and give you two parts, right? Based on two uh, separate chapters of that unit. The first uh, part of my talk, uh, I'm going to discuss the paradoxical meaning of Du, 
and do this is uh, the most important character for me in this book, right? Referring to uh, poison in the modern context, but in history has very rich, uh, uh, different meanings. And I, I'm going to share with you uh, in today's talk. Uh, and then the second uh, part of my talk, I'm going to uh, discuss the various techniques adopted by doctors in China in the, you know, in the past that transformed these powerful poisons into beneficial medicines, right? So uh, that's based on chapter two of my book. Uh, let's start with chapter, uh, the first part, right? So uh, if you uh, know Chinese, uh, this is uh, the Chinese character for uh, poison uh, uh, in modern context, right? So this, this word in, in modern context ha actually has a very negative meaning, right? If you, you say do uh, to a person, to a Chinese person, it's often involves, you know, you know, harming somebody or toxic substances, you know, uh, murder, right? intrigue, uh, this kind of negative, very similar to the English word poison, which is also very negative meaning there, right? So, but in the past, uh, the situation is very different, right? The same character, for example, this is uh, one example I gave in my book. In the pre-Han text, uh, this is in uh, Dao De Jing, right? Lao Zi, it's very, very important in the philosophical text. And there's a passage here which discusses uh, the importance of Tao, that's the origin of everything, right? And Du here, we, we translate the virtue, right? So, so the passage goes, therefore the Tao creates all things, right? That's the origin of everything. And Du, this virtue raises them, right? And, and then there's an elaboration of how Du raises them, right? Cultivates them and fosters them rears them and nurtures them and nourishes them and protects, uh, protects them, right? This is all synonymous. And here, uh, I want to direct your attention to this word do, actually it's the same do as I showed you before. Uh, uh, I translate it as nurture because you can see that this is, do is put alongside with this a collection of words with the same meanings, right? Nurturing, culturing, cultivating, uh, nourishing. So, Definitely, it doesn't have a negative sense here. It's a very positive sense, right? It's the opposite of harming, right? So that is um, one example uh, I find in one of the earliest texts in China, Dao De Jing. Let's move to the Han period of time. We find more evidence. And oftentimes I go to, uh, I, I study the etymology of the word do, I rely on dictionaries. And so in the first, uh, extend dictionary in China. This is a show and it's explaining characters. Uh, we find the basic definition of do actually is sickness, is sickness. And sickness actually in sick dic dictionary refers to uh, the sickness of mountains, right? You can envision this mountains. Mountains actually uh, implies heaviness, uh, maybe intensity, but Sickness or mountains doesn't have any negative sense. It's fairly neutral. And that is the basic meaning of do as defined by this, uh, by this dictionary in the Han period. And then the dictionary offers a second meaning of do where we can clearly see it is more negative, right? It refers to a harmful grass that grows invasively and everywhere. I can envision this kind of pictures, this grass and Potentially harm, I mean, harmful and very explicit there, actually. So uh, it's invasive, right? So you can see there's two kind of medium do explained in this dictionary. One is more neutral and one is more negative. And the negative one is more closely connected to grass or botanical knowledge, right? So, but the first one is important because the first one uh, was carried over into the medical context during the hot period of time. And my interpretation of do in the medical context is potency. It's not, you know, uh, toxic or harmful. It's, it refers to the strengths of uh, the healing, the drugs. So potency on the one hand could harm as a poison, but it could also cure as a medicine. So instead of avoiding poisons altogether, Doctors during the Han period, if not earlier, actually they develop a variety of techniques to transform poisons into medicines, and that's the what my second part uh, will focus on. 
right? But this is the logic why they uh, decided to do that. Um, give you one example, one more example of the medical context. In the medical context, the manifestation of this potency of do, right? So this is from the famous Yeltsin's you know, inner classic. Uh, many of you may have uh, read it, part of it. Uh, and so um, there's a passage here from Huang Di Neijing. Uh, it says, potent drugs attack the devious uh, and the grains provide nourishment. Uh, the five fruits provide support, the five livestock provide enrichment, five vegetables provide replenish replenishment. You can see there's parallels, right? Different kinds of foods or drugs have different functions. And I would like to direct your attention to the first line, right? Potent drugs attack the devious. So potent drugs actually is du yao. It's du yao. Du yao in modern definitely means poison. But here I've translated as potent drugs because definitely it served as a therapeutic agent to attack, right? See that the violent uh, approach attacked. The devious here refers to the malignant entities, the pathological formations inside the body, right? So this is for curing illness, not for harming the body, for sure, in this context. Um, another Han text uh, I see uh, in more detail uh, is the Divine Farmer's classic of Material Medica, Shenong Ben Cao Jing. This is the first extend uh, st uh, text on uh, the pharmacology in China. Right? So, um, in the text, the material medica is the translation of the Chinese words ben cao. Ben cao literally means uh, roots and grass. And the reason I translate it as material medica because there is a tradition of writing about drugs uh, in the tradition starting from the Greek time that is very parallel to this Chinese tradition. So this is actually material medica refers to a genre, a type of writing starting from in here basically includes a list of drugs, in this case 365 drugs, and each drug with the explanation of its uh, location, its properties, uh, its way of preparation, and most importantly, medical uses. Right? So it's a very empirical collection of knowledge, right? One drug after another with a detailed description and very descriptive. And, but it's basically the nature of the material medical text, the Ben Cao text in China, right? So uh, what I uh, would like to uh, pay attention here is the role of Du in Shenlong Ben Cao Jing. And in the preface, interesting enough, Du is used as a basic index to categorize drugs. And so there's a three layer so of uh, categorization here starting from the top level, right? So the top level, 120 drugs. Uh, these drugs are defined as without do, without do, without potency, and they are used to enhance life. And then uh, the middle level, 20 drugs, uh, it's a mixture of drugs, some drugs with do, some drugs without do, and these drugs are used to prevent illness, right? Disease prevention. And finally, the bottom level, we find 125 drugs, and most of these drugs are defined as with do, right? Potent. And they, if they use properly and use temporarily, they are they can they, they, they can serve the purpose of curing illness. So you can see that this very logic of using drug with do here is to cure illness is deeply embedded in the very first uh, pharmacological writing in China. And this three tier hierarchy, right, uh, three level uh, way of div div dividing drugs remained remarkably stable actually in the writing of a material medical text in China. This is the first one and, and, and last, and you know, in the meantime, you know, many of you know Ben Cao Gang Mu, right? So Bai Li Shijin, he basically followed the same structure of dividing drugs based on do. I right, can see do is it's, it's a very important factor here when you think about the therapeutic power of medicines in Chinese pharmacy. Uh, here, I want to introduce uh, 
to you a text, a later text. Uh, so this is a text uh, you are less familiar with than the first uh, text, Shenlong Ben Zhao Jing. Uh, it's a commentary uh, written in around 500 uh, CE. You can see uh, in the title, this word Zhu, right, which means commentary, uh, it's quite important because uh, it started from this text, a long tradition of writing commentary to the previous pharmacological texts. Right? So this tradition uh, started from the Divine Farmer's Classic. That text doesn't have commentary, just the core text of uh, the pharmacological writing. And then this is the first commentary added, right? So in around 500, basically is preserving the previous writing on each of the drugs, but adding more explanations of the drugs, uses, collections, preparations at the end of each of the drugs. So expand the writing of the drugs over time. So, so this is another text during the Tang, as I mentioned before, the state sponsored material medical, adding more, another layer. Uh, this is a Song text, adding another layer. And finally, this is a Ming text, Ben Cao Gang Mu, systematic material medical, adding yet more layers. So you can see that the text expanded over time, not just the number of drugs. The drugs number increased from 365 to almost 1900, but also the content for each drug also get expanded with these different layers there. This is quite important for historians of medicine because some of these early texts like Shenlong Ben Zhao Jing in the Han, they are lost to us long time ago. There's no way for us to recover those original texts, but their content is preserved. This kind of recovering of the ancient knowledge, right? So that's, uh, that's important. Um, okay, so moving forward, um, I'll give you one example of the source I use. Uh, I hope this is something fascinating. This is a manuscript, fragmented manuscript for sure, uh, only a piece here, uh, dating to seventh century, uh, uh, recovered from the, the northwest part of China called Turfan area in the, the modern Xinjiang area. So there are four drugs written here. This is from the uh, commentary, uh, the 500 C commentary, right? So four animal drugs, and this is one of them. You can see there are two kinds of writing, the red writing and the black writing. And the red writing actually is from the original Divine Farmer's Classic, Yuna Han. And the black part is the commentary. So you can clearly see these two layers. Uh, this drug, uh, interesting enough, uh, it's actually uh, the literary name, uh, uh, translation of name is heavenly rat, heavenly rat dropping. Um, so this refer to bat dropping actually. So, and I know bad dropping is only actually in the recent um, uh, couple of years uh, in the pandemic. Um, so, but here um, I'm probably will write something separate as an article discussing the interesting history of bad dropping. But here I want to direct attention to potentially because uh, uh, as early as the fifth century, it is referred to as possessing do, possessing do, right? So, and that information was decisively added in around the fifth century, right? So, so who produced this commentary, this important commentary? Uh, his name is Tao Hongjing, Tao Hongjing. And he lived in the period of time, you can see uh, when China was in division between the Northern and Southern regimes. Uh, Northern regime was controlled by uh, various nomadic people of uh, Turkic, the Mongolian, Tibetan origins. And uh, the Southern regimes, uh, was established by succession uh, by Han people, basically. And Tao, uh, Tao Hongjing grew up near the capital of the Southern regimes. And he grew up from a family who practiced medicine for generations. And he was also quite interested in Taoist practice. And when he was young, he served as a minor officer at the court of the Southern Qi uh, regime for a decade and eventually he abandoned his political career and receded to a nearby mountain called Maoshan Mao Shan, and devoted himself to alchem uh, not alchem here, Taoist practice, a later alchemical practice, as well as compilation of medical 
texts. It's during that period of time, this is toward the end of fifth century, he compiled the, uh, this text, collected commentary to the Divine Farmer's Classic. Right? So, and this text is very important. It occupies most of my space, um, a lot of space, I would say, in this chapter one of my book. Uh, it is, uh, first, it doubled the number of drugs, right, from 365 to 730. It introduced new categories of natural properties, not just the three-tier division of by dual natural properties of minerals, herbs, animals, and foods. And that had remained very stable in the following writing of material medical texts in Chinese history. Uh, he also explained further in his commentary, the mor morphology, location, medical uses. And the last part is the most important for me. He specified the due status of each drug, right? A drug either without do, or with small amount of do, or with do, or with great do, or even some kind of quantitative uh, assessment of the dual status of a drug. And so this specification allows me to do a kind of wholesale st statistics of the distribution of dual possessing drugs in this text, right? So, and this is uh, the result. And you can see that the four categories, right? So, and not surprisingly, the herbal medicines uh, contains the largest number of uh, the, the, the dual possessing drugs here. And that's not surprising because the herbal medicine itself it constitutes the largest portion of all drugs. Right? So uh, you can see uh, more than uh, uh, more than 30, uh, more than 40, I would say, uh, her uh, herbal substances are considered, you know, poisons, uh, do, right? So, but proportionally you can see the animal category has about one third, right? One third of the animal drugs are, are dual possessing. So proportionally, that is uh, quite uh, significant. And when you look at the food category, uh, it's perhaps not surprising that you see the least number of dual possessing drugs there, only 8%, because who's supposed to be nourishing the life, you know, that can be consumed regularly for a long time. So you don't expect to see a lot of poisons in that category, right? Um, I want to also give you some examples of the dual possessing drugs in this important text. Uh, one in each of the four categories of mineral, herbs, uh, and, and animals, and food. And so this is based on the depiction of these drugs from the 11th century text, right? The earliest text containing such illustration of drugs. Um, like cinnabar, as I mentioned before, is a mercury compound. Right, so the transformation between mercury and cinnabar uh, has been found uh, quite early on in Chinese history that rendered the substance magical power in alchemy. And it was also used in Chinese medicine as uh, an effective uh, 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 drug. And aconite, as I mentioned before, uh, a very popular poison used in Chinese uh, pharmacy. Uh, from very early on, and based on one scholar's estimation in uh, eighth century uh, formula texts, 10% of the recipes in that text used aconite, making the prominence the use of the drug at the time. Right? So, and this drug was so popularly used to the degree that Tao Hongjing, right, the, the, the compiler of the, uh, the commentary, claimed or uh, praised the drug as the lord of the hundred drugs. Right? That's as an herbal category. And animal category, uh, python, uh, as I mentioned before, also figured prominently. Uh, the gold bladders of python was used. And especially during the Tang period, the government actually collected uh, python from the far south in the modern Guang Guangdong uh, area, right near Hong Kong. That area, uh, uh, pythons, a lot of pythons, and the, the government collected them for medicine purpose. And finally, in the food category, interestingly, the cannabis appeared uh, in this category as a dual possessing uh, drug. And interestingly, the Chinese name for cannabis in Divine Farmers Classic is Mafin. I hope that's an easy name to remember. Um, this drug, uh, the text specifies, can be consumed with small dose regularly to nourish life. 
But the text also warns the reader that if consumed excessively, uh, it can make a person run crazily and see demons. And that's the language, see demons. Whenever you see a uh, uh, read a Chinese medical text, when they say see demons, that means there's some kind of psychedelic effects, right? So disturbance of the mind, right? So, well, finally, uh, to uh, end this, uh, uh, this section uh, on the discussion of the, the poisons, uh, I want to say that, you know, although my focus of time period is from the third century to, uh, to the eighth century, but the inclusion of poisons in classical Chinese pharmacy uh, went, went way beyond that, right? So this is a one uh, table I produced to give you a sense that from the very first pharmacological test during the Han period to the 16th century Ben Cao Gang Mu, uh, where I list five different uh, material medical texts, you can see the number of drugs increased over time, right? As I mentioned before, and also the number of poisons or do possessing drugs in each of these texts also get expanded, you know, roughly, of course, uh, uh, proportionally, right? So, and based on my, my calculation, consistently poisons constitute about 20%, so one fifth of all drugs in these various pharmacological writings. So it remained very important uh, uh, a way of healing uh, in classical Chinese pharmacy. With that, I'm going to move to the second part of my talk, uh, transforming poisons. Here, uh, I refer to, uh, I, I, I want to share with you the various techniques, right? Since poisons figure so prominently in Chinese pharmacy, what were the techniques doctors in the past used to uh, transform them into therapeutic agents? Uh, the first is doses control that I think is not surprised to many of you, right? This is something that come to our mind first, right? Anything, I mean, how poisonous it is, if you use a small dosage, it could work. Some benign substances, even water, if, if you consume excessively, that could, that could harm our body, right? So doctors in China were aware of this early on. For example, in Divine Farmer's Classic of Material Medica, right? So they particularly offered advice on the use of do possessing drugs, these you know poisons that they, they say that one should start with the amount of the size of a milligram, very small amount. If that doesn't work, a double the amount. And if that doesn't work, uh, increase the dosage even further. So you can see that there is this regulation dosage or change of dosage according to it's carefully calibrated by the recovery of the patient's body, right? But there's a question uh, that naturally comes to our mind. How did they know that the patient uh, is recovered? Right? That's, that, 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 that's the time when you should stop increase the dosage. Right? How, how do we know? And this text, Shen uh, Ben Cao Jing didn't say anything about this, but another text by the famous physician Zhang Zhongjing in Eastern Han called Essential Golden Cabinet offers some interesting insights. So Zhang Zhongjing included a, a, a recipe called decoction of aconite and cinnamon, right? You see aconite, actually I figured very prominently in Zhang Zhongjing's recipe collections. Um, so he said, right, one should use two doses first. And if the patient doesn't feel uh, this medicine, Includes, uh, increase the dosage to uh, three. If still the patient doesn't feel anything, increase the dosage to five. And at the end of the recipe, Zhang, Jun, Zhang Zhongjing also says, to feel the medicine is as if one were drunk, vomiting. This signals that the medicine strikes the illness. So this is a very revealing passage because to our modern eyes, this kind of Responses, we would we define it as symptoms or we define it pathological side effects of uh, the medicine, right? We should we try to avoid that. But Zhang's interpretation is the opposite. This is a necessary bodily sensations, bodily experience that manifests the power of the poisons to strike the illness, to purify the body, and cure the disease, right? So it's a very 
different interpretation. And Zhang Zhongning is not the first person who proposed this kind of interpretation because he actually followed a tradition that, be, that can be traced back to the pre-Han period. And this is a famous quote from not a medical text, from a, a political text called Shang Shu. It says, if a medicine does not elicit dizziness, it cannot cure severe illness. So this is another way to think about the rationale of using poisons in classical Chinese pharmacy from the perspective of the interaction between poison and the body, right? So a poison is powerful, inducing powerful bodily responses, and that is necessary for the elimination of the severe hard to treat illnesses, right? Um, another technique that mentioned frequently in classical Chinese pharmacy is drug combination. Uh, again, back to a uh, divine farmer's classic, it offers seven dispositions. And dispositions here refers to the seven different ways of drug interaction. Actually, the first one is no interaction. It's called single action, which refers to the single drug therapy. And then the next two called mutual aid, a mutual need, a mutual assistant. Basically, it's that putting two drugs together that can mutually enhance each other's activities, right? It's enhancement. And the last four actually is more relevant to the use of poisons, mutual fear, mutual hatred, mutual opposition, mutual killing. So you can clearly see this is an inhibitory uh, relationship, adding one drug to another one that can in, in, inhibit or curb the activity of that drug. And this is relevant to the use of poison because oftentimes you need to combine with a non-poison drug to mitigate its potency, but still preserve its therapeutic power. For example, in the case of using Penalia, a, a, a dual-possessing drug in Chinese pharmacy, uh, the text recommends the combination with fresh ginger that can effectively curb its potency. Right, so, so they are in a mutual fear interaction mode. Other techniques mentioned in the Divine Farmers Classic that includes, for example, drying methods, right? So whether the drug is in the shade or under the sun that can uh, change the moisture level of the drug. So that matters. Um, season of harvest, this is definitely very important. Uh, depends on the season. The, 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 the same plant actually could have very different properties, right? So a location also matters. In Chinese medicine, there is a term called Dao Di, or local medicine, indigenous medicine, which specify the best place to harvest the soil because of climate, right? So uh, that's very important information. <coughs> Excuse me, morphology. This um, uh, I'll mention later in another text. The, keen attention to morphology of um, either its mineral or its, uh, or its herb or animal to tell whether this is authentic or fake drug that involves a human uh, in intervention, whether it's fresh or old, right? And finally, whether the drug is raw or cooked. And this is actually a quite important technique, actually a set of techniques. I want to uh, focus more uh, I give you some information of the history of uh, what I call drug processing, right? The drug preparation. Um, so the raw drugs basically is drugs without any, you know, uh, uh, preparation. And the cooked drugs, this is in the original language in Chinese medicine, cooked drug basically is a drug upon preparation processing. And in Chinese language, uh, there's a term referring to drug process processing called pao zhi, right? So and pao zhi actually consists of two characters, pao and zhi. And see, for you who uh, know Chinese, uh, this is, there's a radical, shared radical here, which refers to fire, uh, which indicates the involvement of heating. And then uh, this part actually means meat. So putting a meat on a fire. So you can see that clearly here, the reference is cooking. And I believe that the origin of drug processing actually you can trace back to the pre han period, to the cooking techniques using fire to, to heat the meat. And that techniques later get, you know, 
transformed and become part of the techniques for drug processing, which speaks to very important relation in food and medicine uh, in Chinese medicine, right? Um, Paozhi in classical Chinese pharmacy, actually, I want to remind you is that it's far beyond just the heating techniques. It uh, involves many other type of techniques of transforming drugs, including poisons. Uh, this is a picture from a much later text, 16th century text on drug processing, um, the frontispiece of the, 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 the text. Um, uh, but it preserves many of the techniques already used in ancient times. And you can see that sitting at the center of this image is a lure. This is Lord uh, Thunder, Lei Gong. Uh, he is uh, considered to be the founder of the preparation of drugs, right? He's a master. And he is surrounded by a group of disciples who do kinds of uh, processing, and here is uh, burning or roasting the drugs, and here is cutting the drugs into pieces, and here is perhaps grinding the drugs, uh, and here is rinsing. So there's a variety of techniques uh, involving in transforming drugs um, in Chinese pharmacy. I want to just use one example, coming back to my favorite character in my book, Aconite, to give you a, a concrete sense of how drug processing was achieved uh, in classical Chinese pharmacy. This is from 11th century text, the same one with illustrations of drugs in it. And uh, actually, uh, I want to point out here is that aconite does not refer to a specific like species of plant. It refers to a collection of plants belonging to the aconitum genus. That genus includes more than 200 species, actually. So it's a variety of drugs in that in in genus, and which acquired different names in Chinese texts, like Wu Tou, Tian Xiong, Fu Zi, Ce Zi. And Fu Zi is the most prominent name, actually. And usually, the tubers of these herbs were harvested for medicinal purpose. And again, uh, timing is important. Uh, for example, Uto actually refers to the single parental tuber harvested in the springtime, which concentrated all the potency of the drug, so it's more powerful. And Fuzi literally means attached offspring, refers to the side tubers growing in the summertime from the parental tuber, which has less potency uh, and so used for you know, other kind of conditions, right? That's foods. Aconite, actually, the reason why aconite was so popular in uh, 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 classical Chinese pharmacy is because it can treat a variety of illnesses. And according to the Divine Pharma's classic, it can treat uh, cold limbs, coughing, clotting of blood, pain in the joints, impediment, and convulsion, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So actonite was considered to be a heating medicine. So it was often used to treat cold conditions, like cold limbs, like clotting of blood. It was also often used to treat emergent situations as a last resort to save the, uh, save the patient's life because of its heating power, right? So to resuscitate a uh, 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 patient who is Who's dying. Um, to give you a more sense of the preparation or processing of aconite, I would like to introduce, this is the last text in my talk uh, I, I, I introduced. It's called Lei Gong Pao Zhe Lun, Treatise on Drug Processing of Lord Thunder. So we encounter Lord Thunder again here. This is the text that can be traced back to, I would say, dating to fifth century or be later than that. Um, of course, it was not written by Lord Thunder. It was named after him. We don't really know the author of this text. Uh, we don't really have the fifth century version of it. Actually, parts of it was preserved in an 11th century material medical text according to this, uh, because of this commentary tradition as I introduced before. It included 300 
drugs uh, pay great attention to the identification, right? The morphology matters much here, and also introduce systematically the sophisticated techniques of drug processing. And using aconite as example here, the text introduces two different techniques of preparing aconite before you know, uh, entering, uh, being prescribed to the patients. The first one, not surprisingly, is the heating methods, brawling aconite. And so uh, basically the text recommends one brawl the whole tubers uh, using the gentle fire and strong fire alternately, right? involve some kind of heating techniques here. And then after that heating, remove the cracks on the surface and then bury this tuber in a, a, a hole, you know, digged uh, at the center of the house for overnight. And the next day, take it out and dry the tubers under the sun and that tuber can be used once it's cut into pieces, right? So that's one way of preparing uh, aconite. And second way is called soaking technique. It doesn't involve in heating at all. It's basically first slice the tubers into thin pieces and then soaked in a black bean uh, with yeast flowing water for five days and five nights. So Presumably this is a longer time of preparation. And after that, uh, dry the tubers, actually dry the pieces, right, the slices and for usage. You can see that two methods with two character, two features. The first one involves more techniques of manipulation of fire, but taking less time. The second one uh, is not that sophisticated in the sense, you know, just soaking in black bean with water, but takes longer time, right? Five days and five nights. The one thing I want to up the out is east flowing water. Right? So what is east flowing water? And Dong Liu Shui, uh, this is in Chinese. Um, this is uh, we can find that in the Han text that during the Han period, uh, government officials who went to a river nearby near the capital, and the river has to you know flowing east direction and they perform this kind of purification rituals to cleanse the fuels accumulated in the preceding year this is done in the springtime right this is a purification ritual and this kind of ritual penetrated into the Taoist practice particularly alchemy uh, in uh, the following centuries when alchemists went into the deep mountains and also find such a stream with water flowing eastward and constructed a chamber, alchemical chamber. They used the water to, to build the chamber. They also used the water actually uh, for alchemical operations as well as ingesting the final elixirs. So there's a very significant ritual significance of using the so-called yeast flowing water. And that penetrated into the pharmacological writing as well. For example, in the eighth century a material medical text called Supplement to Material Medica, Ben Cao Shi Yi. He says, this east flowing water, it's a powerful drug that can cleanse and malignant, the, malig the, the malignant and the filthy medicines fried a boy with it can dispel demons, right? So um, there's a strong connection between poisons and demons that I, I explore more uh, in the chapter three of my book. I don't have time to elaborate here, but suffice to say, Based on these sets of evidence, we find the use of yeast flowing water is not just the water itself in soaking, but it has a very important ritual significance. And that we have to keep in mind in terms of the preparation of medicines, poisons in Chinese pharmacy, there's a material aspect, but there's also this kind of ritual, this kind of cosmological aspect we must take into consideration. So, with all these examples, uh, I uh, would like to uh, say something. The last five minutes or so to say something about the conclusions. Um, at the beginning of my talk, I asked this basic question, what it is a medicine? And I, 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 I take you to this journey back to uh, Chinese history, China, 
to try to find the answer, what is the medicine, right? So, and I want to give you two take-home messages here. And the first take-home message is that medicines are malleable substances. It's with a particular kind of materiality that is highly malleable, right? It's not fixed and changing, right? Absolute. Um, and particularly when we think about the relationship between medicine and poisons, if before coming to this talk, you have this kind of preconceived notion of the separation between poison and medicine, be it in China or in the West, right? So in any culture, we may have this kind of categorical distinction between the two. After listening to my talk or reading my book, you may try to propertize that division, right? Uh, actually, when we think about any substances in Chinese pharmacy, there's no clear distinction between two. And whether a substance was a medicine or a poison or something that altered body in many different ways, it depends on the techniques of that substance preparation and usage. It depends on the experience on the individual body, which I lightly touch upon. It also depends on the political and social meanings assigned to these substances. I'm to talk about that in this talk, but it's, 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 it's part of my book, it's unit two. So that is quite a important lesson I want to share with you, this blurred boundary between poison and medicine and the fluid maturity of what we considered medicine. Um, and that I want to uh, raise this heightened awareness of the paradoxical nature of drug therapy and try to think about Chinese medicine. And of course, there's many distinctions, differences, divergences, but also connections. If we have the preconceived notion of Chinese medicine as being more natural and Western medicine is more artificial in the sense that Chinese medicine often collected drugs from nature, like herbs, Western medicine produce drugs in the laboratory, like chemicals. I think that's a valid point, but that's only the starting point for Chinese medicine because Chinese medicine rarely use drugs directly from nature, right? They have to process it and help prepare it, particularly in the, in the, in, in the use of poisons. Otherwise, it will be very dangerous. So uh, that is something I want to challenge, right? So when you think about natural in Chinese medicine, it's a starting point, but what is followed by technological intervention, it's actually more important. Similarly, I also challenge the dichotomy between Chinese medicine being wild, um, mild and no side effects and Western medicine being violent and weak side effects. By introducing poisons as a topic here, I think I make it uh, abundantly clear that you know it's actually more complicated than that when we think about aconite or chemotherapy, when we compared ginseng or vitamin, right? be it from Chinese pharmacy or Western pharmacy, it doesn't matter that much because we consume these substances of various potency, introduce these substances into our body in the broad sense, we use a poison into our body. So a, 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 a drug's potentials of healing and killing are always intertwined. It's ultimately not the substance itself, but how we use it, right? How we experience it in our body, how we give its meanings in our society and in our culture, that, that is truly, that is what matters the most. That's the first lesson. My second lesson is actually about this key concept of active ingredient and often discussed by both practitioners Transmedicine and also biomedical researchers because they try to really focus on like the Nature Journal article I, I introduced at the beginning of this talk, right? So tell me what is the active ingredient in those mysterious Chinese drugs. And then I can say whether it's safe or not, whether it's scientific or not. And certainly they have a valid point as a, as a person with scientific background. I definitely, you know, uh, shared their sentiments of really boil down the, to, the, to the, the real chemicals that is responsible for the cure, right? So, and we definitely have successful stories like the famous story Tu Yu Yu, right? The Nobel laureate of 2015 in physiology and medicine because her contribution is that her, she and her team successfully isolated 
from this herbs in Chinese pharmacy, artemisia, uh, an active ingredient, artemisinin, uh, which is the most effective drug to cure malaria. And that's why she won the Nobel Prize because of achievement. And that's the success story. Uh, there's also controversial stories like the controversial uh, medicine of gentian liver, dragon uh, uh, draining peel. Uh, and that's, this, is, this is a peel used in both China and overseas. And um, from the 19, late 1990s, there was medical incidents starting from Europe and later to uh, Taiwan and other places that, that you know, patients get sick, uh, a kidney failure. Uh, and later there's scientific research showing that it can cause uh, cancer, liver cancer, bladder cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And the culprit, and one of the ingredients in this pill is called Aristolochia mutung. And again, the active ingredient here is aristoglochic acid, which is responsible according to scientific research uh, for cancer formation. So this drug actually uh, is banned in certain countries from Canada to Japan. I don't think it's banned. I mean, the FDA offers a warning in the US. Um, so scientific committee will say categorically, this is a poison, just ban it all together. But those who are more sympathetic of using Chinese medicine would say actually is the misuse of the drug and the misuse of a particular ingredient that is responsible for the incident. We should not ban the medicine because it could cure certain liver conditions very effectively, right? So this kind of debate, I don't think will end in the near future. It's ongoing, it's useful, but eventually these two examples about active ingredient, I want to open up a space to invite you to think about healing, not just as a reductionist approach to reducing any medicine, being Western or Chinese medicine into a chemical that is responsible for everything. Healing is actually a more dynamic and relational process. Whether that substance, I mean, active ingredient is useful, but we have to take that into consideration with some other factors, right? The techniques of transforming the medicines, how the medicine interact with the particular body and what kind of meanings we give it to that medicine in a particular society and culture. All these putting this medicine in a particular relationship matters tremendously to its therapeutic outcome. So that is my second message to you. And with that, I want to end my talk. I think it's take me about an hour or so to finish my talk. I hope it's not too long. And I very welcome you, all your questions and comments and suggestions and thoughts. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. It was, it was wonderful. I think I, 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 I speak for everybody. It was inspiring uh, to hear your, your lecture now. Uh, well, first of all, hi, Dr. Yang. It's a real pleasure being here listening what you to what you have to share with us invaluable information of course thank you so uh, my, my first question is uh, oh, wait a minute uh, 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 did you think that the trips of the missionaries in the 15th uh, 16th century to Asia have something to do with the chain of the view about the reconstruction of of the material medical theory it is interesting that uh, for example the atlas of acupuncture have a mixture mixture of chinese and western anatomy concepts and that couldn't be possible with the in, with the entrance of western people into china so why not to extrapolate that exchange with all the tcm theory including phyto medicine as well thank you uh, that's a great question uh, javier and yeah. so it is a period beyond Beyond my study, but I do want to comment a little bit on that. Um, so, because um, you can see that one thing uh, I mentioned is that the, the character do uh, in the modern context basically just means poison, period, right? And in the pre modern context for the period I study, it referred to you know, potency and many other rich meanings. So, there is a very interesting historical question for me, at least, is when did that change? Right, so, and I think the early modern period, the period just mentioned, 16th, 17th century, when the Western missionary went to China, uh, bringing their knowledge, I mean, it's kind of bi-directional actually, bringing Western 
the knowledge, but also translating some of the medical text in China, including material medical text, back to Europe. It's bidirectional. Uh, they may have played a role here. So, because I try to just to try to find when did this negative meaning of poison in Chinese medicine started to appear and eventually dominate uh, in Chinese culture. And so early modern time is probably the time that I find, for example, devoted medical books on antidotes. And that actually, I didn't see that before because the rise of consciousness of antidotes actually corresponds to the rise of just poisons as something very different from medicines. Because in the European context, in pre-modern context, this tradition of writing antidotes, basics throughout the medieval period, you see a lot of writings on that. But not in, in China until 16th, 17th century. You didn't see that. And this is whether there is an influence from the Western you know, missionary uh, teaching or whether this is a more of an indigenous development. Uh, that is open question to me. I, I don't have a definitive answer to you, but I think that that's a fascinating topic think about the historical change of the understanding of do or poisons in Chinese medicine. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So thank you very much. And I have one more question and the last one. Uh, what do you think about the, the about the acupuncture is like the main tool of TCM? Don't you think that the, that herbal ben, herbal medicine uh, could be the first in the ranking if people will know more about pharmaco pharmacological actions and active principles to know how to cure whatever pathology exactly and properly? Yeah, so actually that is something I uh, would hope in the future that will happen because it's a tricky issue. Because if you go to, for example, to China <laughs> uh, to see the, the practice of Chinese medicine there, uh, I mean, people do acupuncture, but many more people do medicines, right? So pharmacy, herbal medicine, right? Yeah. Herbal medicines. That's a very robust branch uh, of uh, the, the medical practice in China, but in uh, overseas uh, uh, medical communities, because of the regulation, different countries have different kind of regu regulatory uh, yeah. rules on this. Um, for example, I mean, in the United States, uh, none of these transmedicines can be approved by FDA because FDA have this clinical trial uh, standard or corresponding to the active ingredient, uh, what I met the talk about. About at the end. So basically, this kind of drugs from China are put into the category of uh, supplements, right? Like vitamins, right? So, because that category doesn't need to be scrutinized by FDA. Yeah. So, it's a different channel. And so, of course, that part is less regulated. Uh, so, and subject to patients' own interpretation and usage. Um, so, that's why I think. Uh, the issue of, of course, acupuncture could be dangerous as well, but drugs, I think, particularly the use of these powerful drugs, does raise some issues about uh, what is the proper regulatory uh, mechanism there to uh, uh, secure both its efficacy, but also safety uh, uh, of these medicines. So that um, still, I think we have a lot of work to do on that regard. And, uh, one, you know, direction, of course, uh, according to uh, these messages from the scientific community, right, by medical researchers, that we have to kind of basically do a deep analysis of these uh, medicines to see what's going on in it, to see the active ingredients. Now, I am hesitant to go that route completely because basically it's just changed trans medicine to Western medicine. I mean, of course, we welcome more examples like Tuyo Yu. Yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, trans medicine is more than that, right? Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for reading my book. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. Uh, I, I think I'm going to read uh, once again because uh, <laughs> thank I, you. I think there's some details I... I, I, I didn't catch the, the idea, so one, one, one more reading is, is going to be um, a, great, a great issue for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I've read your book. Thank you. Very, very much. I just have a couple of points for one where I definitely agree. Um, about 15 years ago, 
there was a chemist in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who had a company. He passed away. His name was David Weininger. Mm -hmm. And he put together a TCM database. And I helped him out with this project, which unfortunately was aborted, where he compared active ingredients in Chinese herbs with Western drugs and found that the indication mm -hmm. for the drugs were very similar to the active ingredients in the herbs in some way. Okay. Cross-referencing database. And I pleaded with the company to let me continue working on it. Unfortunately, it was not available and that project has disappeared. So you definitely have people who started at least doing that kind of research. On the other side of the argument is that Western medicine has not done a very good job of finding ways of mitigating this do this toxin side effect. And this is, you find like this triangulation where you see patients on five to eight drugs over the average person over the age of 55, 60, a drug for this, but it causes that. So then you take this drug to deal with that. There's like this cascading production of symptoms. Yeah. And yeah. one of, I, I think I could speak for many of my colleagues when we say that a lot of our herbal form, especially in the realm of cancer treatment, using herbs to mitigate side effects of things like chemotherapy and or post-steroid treatment to bring the kidney function back has become part of our mode of treatment, where, where of course it's legally possible to do so. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this is one area that Chinese medicine has to teach Western medicine. Also, there's a difference between substances found in nature, in my opinion, with the possible exception of minerals, mm -hmm. where there had, there's an, I mean, all substances in Chinese medicine, all natural substances have qi, have life, mm -hmm. including and minerals. Therefore, they have intelligence and they respond to other things in the environment and interactions and even consciousness, if you want to go to that level of things. I'm not sure where synthetic pharmaceuticals stand in this. Um, it's a very difficult subject that but it definitely bears looking at. But mm -hmm. the ability to balance and use powder and uh, Dwei Yao in combination and preparation in Chinese medicine is extremely sophisticated mm -hmm. and can potentially reduce the toxicity and allow these substances to be uh, relatively non-toxic when taken by human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the lesson I think we have for right. medicine. So that's basically my comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Zeb. Uh, I, I will just briefly uh, address each of the three comments. Great comments. Uh, uh, I don't want to you know, take too, too, <laughs> too, too much time. I, I write on everything. It hours to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> right. But just quick, I mean, the first one, the database will be great. I mean, uh, if it's available to the public, I'd love to, because this kind of systematic comparison between Chinese Western medicine through the lens of active ingredient, that, that's great. You know, I, I, I I, I'll be happy if I'm wrong, if actually ingredient is the right way to analyze Chinese medicine, but we need this kind of research on the you know, systematic scale, right? So that's number one. Number two, side effects. It's a very interesting concept because I mean, Western medicine often, as you said, you know, have this kind of side effects. Uh, sometimes they're successful mitigating that, sometimes not so, so successful. It's one angle of Chinese medicine intervention. Uh, but also I want to say that my study of Chinese medicine made me think more about the very, the very concept of side effect. That is, you know, uh, medicine in China, uh, the healing in China often involve a processual, a processual uh, 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 procedure that is, you know, if you have something powerful, violent at the beginning, as long as it doesn't last very long, uh, be not so bad. I mean, using a, a analogy, perhaps a little bit stretched, you know, like, you know, take a vaccine. You have a robust response from your body. It's a manifestation of your robust immune system. It's not something bad. If it lasts forever, that's a bad sign, right? So there is this aspect of healing processual that I find is quite interesting to, when we, to, 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 to urge us to think about side, side effects from a different perspective. And finally, I absolutely agree with you. The Chinese cosmology of understanding drugs involved the, the qi, you know, yao qi, the, the, the qi of medicine. And I would say it definitely includes minerals as well. The last two chapters of my book 
focus on minerals in alchemical and medical context. They talk about shi qi, right? The, the, the qi of the stone quite a lot and its interaction with the body. So, and that, you know, uh, it is a valid point. And it's very different from a synthetic drug produced from the laboratory. You know, is one is from nature and so the pr preparation by various technologies making it more, I mean, taming the drugs in a sense, less toxic, more powerful or more effective. When it's starting from the laboratory, of course, without the cosmological view of, of, or chi or whatever, it's a modern biomedical framework. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, point you raised. That's very- uh, Thank you, Zev. Yeah, thank you. It's very interesting that your book came out the same time as the minerals volume of the Bunzao Gang Mu from uh, Paul Unschuld's translation. So, it's yeah, yeah, an interesting cross referencing between the texts. Finally, um, are you familiar with Tibetan medicine or Ayurvedic in terms of their use of toxic substances? There's something called precious pills, where they have a very detailed processing of of, of iron and gold and even mercury into non-toxic substances. And um, there, it seems like the Chinese experimented a lot and there were some tragedies along the way, the cinnabar poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder yeah, if you feel like yeah. the Chinese succeeded in getting to that point of uh, purification in the medicine. Um, just quickly, you know, I'm not a specialist in Tibetan medicine, but I want to, I just typed in this title of the book and the author's name uh, in the chat box for everybody and your reference. Um, uh, wow. Taming the Poisonous, Barbara Gurk. Uh, this book was book. just yeah. published uh, early this year uh, by uh, medical anthropologist Barbara Gurk. And so, so it's open access, so you can get download free. So, I mean, she basically focused on the mercury, um, mercury compound as a, as a powerful medicine in Tibetan medical culture. So uh, that's, that's a great book to to, to read, yeah. She's, she's great with, the, with that stuff, thank you. So uh, thank you again for, for joining us today and bringing from your knowledge and your style of teaching, which was really illuminating uh, and, and it's a great contribution for our medicine. So thank you very much. Thank you Guy for this great opportunity. Uh, and thank you everybody. Uh, some stay really up late <laughs> to attend. It's really wonderful feeling to uh, communicate with people all over the world through, the, through this online forum. And so yeah. um, uh, really, uh, really uh, excited. And so if you have a chance to read my book, you know, uh, I really look forward to comments, critiques, or, you know, hopefully it's a useful one. Uh, and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.